Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Jeffrey, and Emma, and Charmaine, and Chris, and um, all the students who are in the workshop this, this, uh, this weekend past. It just made it a really great, memorable occasion for me to be here. Um, it's just a great honor, so I appreciate it very much. Um, basically, Judy, <laughs> Judy pretty much said everything I have to say. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but you know, I'll, I'll say it again, just uh, <laughs> since I'm here. Um, the, uh, I was digging around on the internet, just sitting there. It was kind of great. I was sitting over here by myself and CJ, and Michael, start, people just start giving me stuff, you know, books and CDs. Um, and the music was, was thumping, everything in school, you know, so um, try to move in the spirit of that. But while I was digging around on the internet, I just happened to find uh, this great poem that I had never read before by June Jordan, which I think is an epigraph for everything I want to say, although it's not really an epigraph, it's just, she says pretty much everything I want to say tonight too. So, <laughs> um, it's called Poem Number Two on Bell's Theorem or the New Physicality of Long Distance Love. There is no chance that we will fall apart. There is no chance there are no parts. So what I'm going to read tonight, uh, the, the essay at least, or the talk, is uh, called Recess and Nonsense. Um, and I guess it's got a subtitle, The End of the Poetry World and the Ends of the Poet. And it's just 11 sections, so it won't take too long. Um, one, in whiteness is property. Cheryl Harris produces an analysis of whiteness as a property, as a mode of property, as something that can be owned and traded and placed in exchange to the advantage of the one who owns it. But she also allows and requires us to think of whiteness not only as a property, as a property, but as the principle of property. If whiteness is property, blackness is the critique of property on the one hand, and the celebration of dispossession or non-ownership or unownership on the other hand. This other hand means the critique is anticipatory, that it is not only before what it critiques, but that it brings what it critiques into something almost like existence. Given the brutality of property's belated, reactionary, regulatory power, there has been no more terrible burden than to be enjoined to celebrate dispossession. When possession is the motivation and constitution not only of the world, but of the very idea of world, earthly existence must bear a homelessness that no person, if the theory of personhood is to be believed, can bear. In this regard, neither hoping or even fighting for a place in this world, nor any gesture or movement toward the otherworldly will do. This is all to say that to say that whiteness is property is to say that the modality in which whiteness can live or the modality in which whiteness is endured or survived is spatial. This is, in turn, to say that whiteness isn't just a venal, brutal, vicious way of taking up space. Whiteness is, rather, the way in which so-called subjectivity is constituted as spatial, or more precisely, as spatiotemporal coordination so that whiteness is also manifest as a brutal way of taking up or taking other people's time. But to be a subject, to be a person, to be white, isn't just to take up space time in a fucked up way. What's at stake, rather, is that, conf is that confluence where whiteness, subjectivity, and spatiotemporality as such converge, constitute one another, and are given in that mutual constitution as being in the world. One special way to describe that confluence, special because it is a deep intensification of the exaltation and shame that goes with it, is being a poet, which is to say being a citizen of the world of poetry. Blackness in its inveterate earthliness is more plus less than that. Two, 
I guess you could say that if whiteness is the transcendental aesthetic, then blackness is the imminent aesthetic. But this is too stark. Blackness isn't a pole. It's an impure, impure refusal of bipolarity. We angels of dust, after all. And we can't forget the asymmetries of sovereignty. Sovereignty is Apollonian isolation. It's sociopathic singularity, the optic whiteness of its whiteness, its tendency to be or go rogue. States don't have a right to exist. Do peoples, do people, do persons have such a right? Do poets? Perhaps existence obliterates the economy of rights. Can persons be self-determining? Are atoms self-determining? Does the kind of determinism that Einstein and Bohm desire imply something on the order of a more broadly physical self-determination of and in nature? Are these two kinds of determination cognate? These are questions of black study, given in the open idiom of black poetry. What is revealed in their iteration is that there is no ontological, aesthetic, political, physical, or metaphysical fundament whose rest black study does not dis disturb. Three, Jay Carter asks, what are the God terms that underwrite human, political, aesthetic sovereignty? But what if the question is rather, what are the man terms that underwrite sovereignty? Why did man become God? What protocols of what Sylvia Winter might call overrepresentation serially reproduces this collective psychosis, which, for fun, you could call Anselm's mirror stage? Anselm the saint, I mean, not Anselm the barricade, however saintly he may be. What if the first step is the assumption of a body? What is it, Gail Solomon, to assume a body, to take up a body, to take one onto oneself a body? for the body and the self to take one another on. What remains beyond that address? What if that address, that aggressively impossible refusal of vulnerability, that projective settlement is sovereignty? And what if the taking up or on of whiteness is, as it were, a step within that step that is continually reactivated when property imposes and supervises the giving and taking of properties and names? Meanwhile, riot, mutiny, the general strike, the remorseless working, the undercommon tragic comedy, its antinomian swerve and quarrel, living's dissolute spread, its dispersive largesse, its transubstantial fade, seems always already to have been a black thing you wouldn't understand because it passeth understanding. Can we speak then and appositionally to some insubstantial pageantry of the phonically antisubstantial. Are substance and sovereignty so bound up with one another, substance being the real physical matter, that which has mass, occupies space, is on time's line, that we have to imagine something like an unreal, or more properly, a surreal physical matter so we can get the body, which is to say the man, off our back. Hortense Spillers and Toni Morrison teach us that flesh is surreal physical matter, that it neither has nor occupies. So that what's at stake is the necessity of a more emphatic inhabitation of flesh as something other than withdrawn or withheld or reduced body, as that which is therefore opposed to body, to the aesthetics or poetics of self that is the body's assumption in vampiric animation for poetics of flesh, for poetics of selflessness. One wants to speak of, through, as flesh in its own terms, but flesh has no terms and one can't speak. Having no mass, flesh is the critical celebration of the mass. Flesh is displacement, that transformational gravitational warp. Flesh is the nonsense of the irreducibly consensual, the cenobitic jam, Flesh is recess. Four, another sacrament is at hand, on a hand other than the political ecclesiastical performativity of ingestion. 
What did Anselm mean by debt? Here's where moratorium comes into play, a recess, a postponement, a refusal to settle accounts, instantiates an already given sociality, a blurring. Nathaniel Mackey might say creaking of the word, given in and as the disavowal of ends when the unpayable, the unsettlable, is announced as a radical disruption of the very idea of accounting, of accountability, of the account. Debt and death ring out like a horn's inhabitants. One bear, one bear silence come back in breathy thicknesses to tell us that assuming a body is like exhuming a body or ingesting a body, only bloodier. You can't take this. This is not my body. Ain't nobody here, not here. In this displacement, we flesh. Love that. Claim this miracle. Five. For an analytic of radical dissatisfaction, of the generally and radically unsatisfactory, I know why we're justified in claiming home, self, body, but the justification doesn't make it right, and what we claim ain't good just because we claim it. A state's existence isn't a function of right or rights. Its existence is a function of might, which then appeals to a logic of rights, of justification embedded in the brutalization it extends in, attempt, in attempting to negate it. But that state's justification doesn't translate into its right to exist. If there were a right to exist, wouldn't it be predicated on what you've done rather than any possible argument regarding why you are? And yet, what could any sovereign entity ever do to justify its existence? This is not a philosophical question about what might happen. This is an under-philosophical question about what has happened. How do we come to accept what we already know about the already existing and about what we need? How do we consent to what we are and what we need? Six, I love black people to be around them. To, to, I love black people too much to be around them at school, but I wanna be around them everywhere. I love black people in an absolutely anabiological way. But I don't care about the black community, which is an artifact of exclusion for which I have neither nostalgia nor desire. If I say this to you, it's only because they won't let me say it to them while they chant social justice in public by themselves. I'm only talking to you right now if you think I am, or if you think you are. Who all here will have allowed for that? to consent to the gravitational pull of a specific analysis that comes out of a series of interlocking exclusions, but is irreducible to those exclusions, and is, rather, given and instantiated in a set of erotic practices, would mean not only to acknowledge an already given and constantly regenerated and regenerative blackness, but also to take up an open set of specific designs on engaging in those erotic practices. This complex modality of consent is the very opposite, the very destruction of inclusion and of whatever entity or polity or community that would have the vile, brutal, murderous, expansionist, colonial intention to include or be included, where community attenuates rather than attends. We're talking about a mutual gravitational field or influence or deeper still entanglement that admits of no prior separation but insists on what Denise Ferreira de Silva calls difference without separation. Meanwhile, the sovereign body is the incarceration of difference. It plays and replays itself as individuated mourning for lost community like a ham bone made of plastic. There's a deep commitment to the settler's vicious longing for welcome, and poets can make it sound good. Seven, can difference without separation survive realness? Only, perhaps, if realness is productively misunderstood as passing through rather than passing as the real, which is to say, as its impossibility. What if, on the one hand, there really is nothing like the real thing, and on the other hand, there really is nothing like the real thing? Real thing is as practically redundant as sweet thing. The real race, 
the race race. It's a race thing. This real thingliness is suitable in its repetition for persuasion. The question of what it is to be real is bound up with the question of what it is to be a thing among things. But this problematic of passing through the real, which is movement through the general problematic of the law of genre in order to think its recomposition, its improvisation, but in a richly redoubled real ass way such that every invocation of the real is as in Aretha's cover, which gives premature birth, as it were, to Marvin's and Tammy's original, a surreal, unreal covering and uncovering and recovering and discovering of it. Therein would be a declaration that there's no such thing as that static statist conception, that there ain't nothing like that, that in passing through the real thing, which is nothing like the real thing, we become no things, or what De Silva calls no bodies against the state. Eight. What if entanglement is a consequence of the idea of wave particle duality and quantum mechanics that actually undermines that duality and then those mechanics? If space time and its laws break down at the subatomic level, then how do we judge the realness of space time? Maybe we just pass through the slits in it, the conflict between the classical and the quantum having required us to suspend judgment in a general sense, or at least to fastidiously qualify every judgment with J.S. Bell's acronym for all practical purposes, which, or FAP, he uses it in these papers he writes. And that's the same J.S. Bell that, that June Jordan was talking about in that poem. Okay. Um, anyway, J.S. Bell's acronym, acronym FAP, for all practical purposes, which is just a Scottish version of the Ohio player's FAP. And even then, what if there is a, gen a more general and practical social and aesthetic purpose to which this ritual caveat is inadequate? What if entanglement not only problematizes the idea of wave particle duality, understood as a system, as a composite mental apparatus, but of their prior separation and discretion as well? Here, I know that I am either radically misunderstanding or radically disturbing or simply obsessively applying even Bell's deconstruction of the opposition of system and apparatus, his dissatisfaction ultimately with the constitutive decisive power that is given to measurement and the concomitant reduction of thinking to measurement if one desires to consider that the confluence of quantum mechanics and entanglement or non-locality revives Parmenides' formulation that it is the same thing to think and to be. What if then we are allowed and required to think the concepts of wave or particle or wave particle systemic duality as apparatuses rather than as systems in or of physical reality? So that the very conceptualization of that which is to be measured is itself an apparatus that is constitutive of the very activity of measurement. What if the richness and complexity that appeal to duality is meant to preserve can only be preserved by way of a movement through that duality, so thoroughgoing that it destabilizes the very idea of measurement through which the duality is instantiated? What if there's an anomic animus that throws off my ambic stride? The disruption of a normative dispensation or allotment or apportionment or measure immeasurable, uncountable number, a wronging or a ringing of the word, an essential and constitutive criminality in the word, the immeasurable from which measure flows, verse fugitive both from itself and freedom, thereby disregarding every prosaic and presidential precedent. The metaphysics of fascism is this, absence of choice given in the proliferation and imposition of irrelevant choices. Let's take time out from all that. Recess, to escape discretion, either as the determination of the observer or as the self-determination of the observed, structured in whatever opposition of wave and particle. The break, the hollow, the holler, the ditch, the dungle, the good foot, the mutron. Nine. Poetics is the difference between whatever it is that you think you have to say and whatever it is that language does. Or 
Poetics is the relation and the difference between content and form. Or poetics thinks and enacts the differences that, in, that constitute the relation between content and form. For example, Claudia Rankin has an auditory signature, a sound, the microtonal oscillation between defeat and self-congratulation that accompanies the visual track. Just as, say, Steve McQueen, the filmmaker, not the movie star, has a visual signature, a look, similarly microtonal, the nervous back and forth between horror and decoration. But do either of them have a poetics? Citizen is an exhausting, exhaustive proof that the citizen is exhausted. It follows from don't let me be lonely, which proves the impossibility and radical undesirability and irreducible loneliness of sovereignty and underprivilege of self-possession. But is it a proof or a restatement of a proof? An iteration of the already proven that doesn't so much make it more elegant or succinct, but rather signs it, or in another sense, takes up the assignment of signing for it or co-signing for it, sharing a kind of investment in the subject slash citizen's constant and irreducible melancholic attachment to itself as laws. Rankin has something else to say about a seemingly general and unavoidable cathexis to the impossible and the undesirable. Perhaps what's at stake is that evidentiary post-conceptual forensic thing. Let me write you a song about all that shit you did. I'll put it in blue notes in broken English, and when I cross you up, I can be crossing over. We both at the airport. Why wouldn't you like that shit as much as me? I don't mean to be mean. I know you mean well. But what if eating the Wall Street Journal commits to a kind of an initiatory ingestion in order to prove a point that ain't worth proving? Another evidentiary gesture towards what we already know. When will knowing what they've done as how we feel reach the point where it no longer needs to be proved? Why do we continually submit ourselves to this trial, an endlessness for which we volunteer as an application for admission? When will we break free of the annular advancement and critique of this restrictive notion of the evidentiary? Sometimes it feels like we're tired of feeling like that. But can we imagine imagining what exists? Can we get to the imaginary evidence of our existence? Why can't we see or hear that we'll never see or hear our inanimate and objectified bodies within the aesthetical juridical frame? To address this question by way of another rendering of it that would be, that would be precise enough to unask it requires escape from the critique of judgment. There's still something left to give up, the desire to be seen in order to see, the desire to ingest in order to expel, the desire to indict. On the other hand, the jurist generative mobilizes imaginative evidence outside the aesthetic juridical frame. So we have to sing this song that Rankin has all but surreptitiously written called On Nothing in Citizen. Ten. Because there's a recess in Citizen that's missing in 12 Years a Slave. An invitation Rankin extends that McQueen is caught between watching and grudgingly accepting. Recess is where the music, the music poetry, the musique comes from. Poetry finds, poetry finds, poetry founds. Out of airy nothing, poetry finds and founds nothing at all. Is there a logic of poetic discovery, an analyrics of entanglement that is not in memoriam of identity, a poetics of the unparticular? It's not that there's nothing more or nothing new to be said about antisociality, i.e. the crowded but solitary anti and anti-vestibular stall wherein Brownian selves, Brown study themselves between mutually assured destruction and mutually destructive realization. It's that nothing more and new need be said. Poetry is not for something else to be said about things. Poetics is not the bridge between whatever someone has to say and the fact that some, some, something else is said. Nothing more and new need be said. 
poetry is recess. It says nothing in praise of nothing, constantly, serially, fugally. If you think this is all nonsense, you flatter me to the point of my disappearance. 11. Nonsense is erratic trajectory, erotic in its refusal of narrow representations of representation, and with the complex interplay between nothingness and thingliness, the paraontological field within which the distinction between nothing and everything is constantly improvised. Blackness is situated in the sensuality of the nonsensical rather than in the already given supersensuality of the epidermal. However much the critique of authenticity is intended to assert a right of difference, the critique of authenticity is often nothing more than a disavow of accentual, consensual nonsense which is not just one difference among others, but is precisely the field within which the general right to difference is both theorized and enacted, the surreal thing. The difference or relation between color and sense is often treated as a sociological matter. That's how we study, for instance, the ways that epidermal differences, which are manifest not only in the color, but in the volume of one's skin, have been so often aligned with having or not having sense. The analytic of the epidermal elides what it, is, what it also illuminates. And there's a difference, and there's also a relation between sharing the social costs that attend epidermalization and distributing the benefits that accrue to senses irreducible supplementarity. Both can be spoken of in terms of privilege, but often the color line between privilege and precarity is drawn with imprecision. When privilege is understood simply to accrue to whiteness, it is not only privilege, but also whiteness, which is situated at the intersection of good sense and brutality, which is misunderstood. The operation within which I am held and to and by which I am given, the particular impersonation from which the sounds you hear right now derive, which I would associate with illicit seeing, with multiple sensing, with black theory, which is to say theory, with black history, which is to say history, is the nonsensical. Nonsense is sometimes manifest as a kind of happiness. And this capacity to be happy, to celebrate, is the condition of possibility of criticism's necessarily un necessary unhappiness. What we have, insofar as we give it away, lets us know what and under what conditions we should have. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to read too much, <laughs> but um, a couple of things. So um, this is a bunch of stuff that I've been working on, and it's really been kind of in collaboration with other people. and. Uh, Sometimes the collaboration is really conscious and the, there's a presence in terms of the relationship. And in other times, um, it's, it feels like collaboration even if the folks are not even here, alive anymore. Um, so, uh, so it's been each, each of those kinds of things. Um, so I, I just read four or five things. This is called Sun and Shade and um, it's a, there's this, I, I, I wasn't really prepared, I should have brought my computer, but there's a beautiful photograph by um, Roy D. Carava, it's a great uh, black photographer that's based in New York, that was based in New York and was kind of famous for his brilliant photographs of jazz musicians, but he also did this really great collaboration with Langston Hughes called The Sweet Fly Paper of Life, which you can find. Um, but it's a really amazing picture of these two little boys, little black boys playing in Harlem, and there's a direct kind of line that separates the sun and the shade when, in their play. Um, and it's just a beautiful photograph just in terms of the, just the formal composition of it. And so, um, <laughs> see what happened was this guy asked me to write something about it for some kind of a, like a journal or exhibition or something, but I think he pretty much didn't like what I wrote, but, but that's okay. So. <clears throat> sun and shade. 
Blackness is the ceaselessly miraculous demonstration that there is no black and white, just sun and shade. All throughout his long and glorious career, Roy D. Carava serializes this insight as an irreducible element of art consciousness, consciousness's remedial education, as he registers the condition that is without remedy. He photographs people continually getting over the fact that they can't get over, revealing their terribly beautiful inability to get over the fact that they do, which is given in looking back in mournful wonder, ahead in worn anticipation. Insofar as the photograph looks back and forth like that in general, its existential condition is given when blackness in play, as the play of sun and shade, is regarded. The capaciousness of black's color field is actualized out from the outside, all in all, all this insight forming outside in us. Efforts to achieve black's purity misunderstand its depth of study in the documentation of play's concrete abstraction where abstraction folds in documentation, given understandings of abstraction therein being unfolded, unraveled, taken away, but in, put in play. Black is an all but gray-blue university. The contemplative eclipse of portraiture and its substructural metaphysics that sociality convenes. It's like a detail in Bruegel that Bruegel left out or something left out in Bruegel and recovered from and in its immersion in a terrible, projective, illuminative solution of silver and gelatin. Particulate dispersion is applied in the interest of monstrous, ecstatic showing. Faces are held between torn up and hiding, grotesquerie and umbrage. That's our non-particulate dispersal. The development of excluded essence is a tragedy that, Der that the Carava renders miraculous. What it is to look at black as black, all up in all of it so emphatically that in its absence, color is everywhere, where De Carava carefully, playfully, unsettlingly, unsettlingly resides. What it is to reside without settling, is that is or is that ain't like being stuck in sweetness, held in life. Black life is like Ife in hell or on the L which is the sound of joy, sun says. Sun who? Sun house, I think, unhoused someday in Harlem's bright Mississippi. Two little boys drawing out that string in strange, strung out dispersal. See, their play is fraught. Insistent movement, nervous muscularity, mobility that stays, that's all but still, but for the shift in overtone. Captured motion's constant flight turns out always to sound like something. The shit is eerie enough for the difference between loud and quiet not to signify. Silence and blackness are more plus less than one in this regard, which is a kind of regardlessness as the train falls through the trees, skyscrapers and everything and nothing. The sound the Carava sees is movement, a resonance of back and forth and falling from partition to partiality a preference for our social incompleteness. Individuation played out, relation exhausted and obscure, tensile revelation held right here. What's happening? I know something's happening, because everything is moving. Now it's gone. Every photograph is a photograph of that, which an actual photograph of that makes deafeningly clear. It's not that it's not a sin and a shame that sun and shade is so beautiful. It's just that black, in being so beautiful, is forgiveness. Okay. Um, all right. What do I got? 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 Um, this is called the, the general bomb. It's a John Dunn phrase. I think, I think I must have started writing this like when I was teaching, was it that class? Yeah, so this is, something came out of there. <laughs> um, and, and this was written kind of in conjunction with this great um, artist and filmmaker, um, videographer named Sine Woods, and this musician, great musician named James Gordon Williams. We did a kind of performance together. Um, the general bomb. 
but not for me twice. Staggered, looping, it's cool too, because the density is light, phonic sparkle. Flesh ropes the body it waits for, when three threads out in fans and brushes, in duress of implotment, in possession, immersion ruptures solitude no matter what. We can't breathe forever. We look for air pockets, an informal market on the corner, the club, a chapel made of bottle trees. Every last breath, we want to breathe somebody. So beautiful in refusing, graphic in quartering ourselves. Anna solid in embrace. Wasn't nobody but some chords in various anti-states and jingles. Blackness is arpeggiation and displacement. Blackness is swimming. Can't quite let the water go or be. We harp on the water. The blackness of the whole thing is that our flesh lights up the world. The ringing, the bubbles, the particles appear to fade in suspense. What else might happen to us folds us in. Not but amniotic wail. We're whales. We hate the world. We love the word whorl, our whirlpool pianism, our practice, our saturated name. Okay. Um, this is actually something that, um, so they, uh, uh, the 10th anniversary of Octavia Butler's death, they had a, uh, the, her, her papers were, were sold, I guess, to the Huntington Library in Pasadena, and they had a kind of series of events commemorating the 10th anniversary of her passing, and they let a bunch of people go into her, see the papers, you know? So, um, so, so I had to write something. Um, it was kind of an interesting but horrible thing, because I never, I don't mess around in archives. I'm too, there's too much stuff on TV for that. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I was really fascinated by being able to look at her sort of commonplace books, these little notebooks that she had and where, you know, she, you'd see the beginning of she's working out an idea for, for novels and stuff. So um, this is called A Commonplace Flaw. And there's an epigraph by, uh, from a, a great scholar named Ruth Wilson Gilmore. And she writes, the black radical tradition is after capitalism as well as before and during in multiple modalities always. Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy is all about this, I think, using the scariest life substance, cancer, to reflect on expansive, constantly changing sociality. What's a commonplace book? One of yours is blue, a blue spiral with a little yellow, a little yellow with a sign and a 79. The flaw that would have made me scrape the price tag off is something you don't have. Because your openness to flaw is perfect, you can stay with impurity. We come a long way to love the human taste. You never settle. Walking away from freedom to find a ceremony gathering passages of hasn't happened yet in dreaming through what has, always making the book of the commonplace. It's a theme of general application, a salad of many herbs whose scheme is burning in an essay concerning human understanding. The novel is an essay concerning human understanding when you hear the commonplace. Hume ripped and folded in the open house. Home is impossible when you grew some church in broken Hume. It's already open, so I can't open it. Why pretend interior to access? Why look for secrets when all we need is a margin we can build stuff in and out of? Even if the chromosome is arbitrary, there might be true devotion in the fingerprint. Can I caress a thought up in your notebook? Touch a whisper your collective head? Let me make it chroma. You teach me how to want a taste. Got me trading for a gene of the general strike. Your research and seizure is a recess of seed. If we stop, can we grow? I'm still a child who loves fun and play, an adolescent, idealistic and unrealistic, an adult, pragmatic, bitter and frightened, some ash flung, spent and critical, some waving, 
permanent and gone. I'm still a feel who loves fun and play. Something quiet, intense, utterly real, even when and where it's weird. Her F's all curved like E's. A human wandering, a terraformed Mars, terraformed, wishing not to be forgotten. Photocopy all postcards. Radio all photography. Intelligence and compassion all phonography. Perhaps there is a mission school wherein natives are kept from doing what comes naturally. We naturally make some in some broken skin. We came to read a suit made out of it. A spider mother submits to being eaten by her young. My kids eat your kids. This generation I eat you, next generation you eat me. Fitness determined by who consumes who. Mating is a true struggle with two beings striving to consume one another. They are biologically the same, but when one kills and consumes the other, the consumed one acts as male and fertilizes the reproductive cells of the consumer. We need to grow some flowers through their hearts. They await the ecstasy of being eaten. Flow on flaw is stereo, and I yearn for sisters, because brotherly love is existential theft, an ethics of agriculture when it's way past that, like a truck full of cousins and cushions, or a bathhouse on the run, or a ship in dry rub. But you still hold out a platform for massage and tune. There's so much life and death and all this generative gone that you just left a table full of planets, a lot of them blue, with stations and yellow changes. Antigone claims unintelligibility by resisting the imposition of unintelligibility. Lilith broods her brood, her flaw, an anhygienic relay. If you could ever be alone, it would be like every time I say everybody, when I sound the same in assuming everybody but you sound different and what it is to veer by way of choir and bend and liquefy the angle's rectitude, to tweak or twerk or turk or torque like making do, to make Norma stop and grow like Cora. Your substance is substitution and there's a messed up warmth beneath stance, an infinitely purple twirl of ground, the enemy within and around and nestle but it's just some presidents, and you know your thing's unprecedented. Raised, urged, ingestion effect, revolutionary gestation, evolutionary indigestion. Some blush or bruise or brush or blur, some blue, a little yellow, rhythmed like the said to never turn that turns the dial. Oh, when I wake up in the morning, the very first thing that I do, I turn on my radio and I listen to Y O. You. Um, so I read uh, a couple more. Um, this is uh, called The Showing. Um, and it was kind of a response to this dance performance that I saw. It was choreographed by, uh, by Cynthia Oliver. Okay. The Showing. Remote, quad crossing loose in fours like movement, limit shade and blur grid, touching without looking, frictive footing making music like the people on a horn. Young men, don't drop your sound. The need of grunt and breath are the making of the music. Airy hambone, osteoporotic hock, heirloom lattice in an open corner, this mutual enlargement, this collective amnesty, a riot of rights for giving bodies away, some Miller high life in this funky joint. Walking hard, irregular runway in slanted circling, urging refusal of joining, she mad, man them, and it feel like it ought to feel like that all the time, like the old man's inverted saxes, an impersonality of impersonation. The sections have proper names, Curtis, active Curtis in non-local rooms, which is why they kill every last one of us, so they can't kill all of us. Ship ahoy, ship of fools in shambles, like we carrying something. Helen's beauty is the brow of Egypt, the studious informality of no thing. Face faded in the water, it troubles. The way we carry ourselves is that we carry ourselves down to the waves and wave, or down to cross it. 
Young men, don't be shy with sound, not give blue lights, look too modern, too high lift. Give dance hall rupture, handle the various proximities, interview improvisation like Andre, like a sustainable harvest of apposition. And after you come home from locking, make a salad for Olivia and spell M in Blackland's cerebral puff. Shakalaka boom, y'all, which amounts to all this mothering, really, an audible footprint, a constant signal to the music. Curtis builds, and they walk out of murmurs, and everybody know. Impreservation is the verstimule of the world, running out of manhood long ago. That's the showing. That's the residue of carrying something more than something. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, yes. One more. This is actually um, for uh, this really good friend of mine. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I feel like I should say it. I said it. I guess that's how I feel. Can you have a really good friend that you maybe only saw like 20 times? Okay, then he was this guy named Bob Coleman. He was a grad student at Berkeley when I started there, but he had kind of left, I think in the early, late 70s, early 80s, like a whole lot of black graduate students at that time when the university departments were finally making a so-called effort to hire black professors and they would kind of scoop up black graduate students just as they were finishing their exams before they finished the dissertation and kind of hire them to these impossible jobs, you know, where you would have to teach, you know, two, three classes a semester or whatever, but also be everyone's advisor and do all this administrative work. And it was just a way of you know, I mean, I think it kind of was useful in the sense that it helped to instantiate a lot of black studies programs in universities, but it also really deprived all of us of the scholarship that those folks would have produced because they hired them in a way that didn't allow them to produce anything. So, and Bob never finished his degree, but he would come around Wheeler Hall where the English department was in Berkeley. And uh, I don't know, it was almost like he just was coming just to make sure we were okay. You know, um, so, I, so I, and he always had, I, he had a, he had a smile that was like a genuinely beautiful smile that seemed to exude genuine happiness, but it was sad at the same time. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying. So, anyway, um, this is called Bob Coleman on the Steps of Wheeler. I would hear, I'm so full, I'm so tired. Now this was carried as a brilliant smile. Fullness is the river of my friend's smile. The river is overflown and there can be no portrait. I'm so full, I'm so tired of this version of the stairway in a hollow building. There can be no portrait, but there is a porch, an easement, an ease of reception and extremity, of welcome and having never been welcomed. What I would hear in the sight of my friend was this undertone turned into something we could share. He was there as what had always been, having found a way to give himself away through that half solitude they try to make you try to ask for. What was always there was that holding of our hands out when the night gets thick. He would tell us lightly all about that just in passing, smiling, here, here. I'm so full, I'm so tired. I'm your patient ancestor. 